Hi, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech video blog, and in this video we continue our five-part series on tool grinding with part two, in which I show you how to grind a general-purpose right-hand cutting tool. Here's the tool we'll be making. The right hand turning tool is a type of single point cutting tool. It's called a turning tool because it's used to machine external cylindrical surfaces. It's called a right hand tool because it cuts from right to left, toward the lathe spindle. And we're calling this a general purpose tool because it's a sort of Goldilocks geometry designed to handle light roughing and finishing work on a variety of materials. In order to grind an actual working tool, we need to define its geometry numerically. The side cutting angle on our tool is zero degrees. The side cutting angle can be positive, neutral, that is zero degrees, or negative. Positive angles remove material more efficiently, so they're suitable for heavy roughing operations. However, they also produce a tapered surface rather than a flat face at diameter transitions. Neutral and negative side cutting angles lead with the tool nose, so they can cut up to a square shoulder. The end cutting angle is 15 degrees. This provides enough clearance behind the tool nose to turn straight cylinders. The side relief angle and end relief angle are both 10 degrees. This provides just enough clearance underneath the tool nose to minimize rubbing. The side rake angle and the back rake angle are also both 10 degrees. The rake angles can be positive, neutral, or negative. Hypothetically, it would be preferable to have as positive of a rake angle as possible to reduce cutting resistance. However, in practice, rake angles which are too positive can excessively weaken the cutting edge and shorten the life of the tool. In general, softer workpiece materials, like aluminum, permit very positive rake angles, in the neighborhood of 15 to 30 degrees. And harder workpiece materials, like steel, require much less positive rake angles, in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 degrees. Neutral rake angles are sometimes used to simplify cutting tool manufacture, or to keep the tool from grabbing or biting when cutting certain materials, like copper alloys and some plastics. Negative rake angles form stronger cutting edges, but they also increase cutting resistance dramatically. They are rarely, if ever, used with high-speed steel cutting tools. Finally, the tool nose radius is 1 32nd of an inch. The tool nose radius increases the durability of the tool and improves part surface finishes. Here's an example of two surfaces generated with the same parameters by a tool without a tool nose radius and a tool with a tool nose radius. The tool with the tool nose radius generated a surface with a noticeably better finish. However, excessively large tool nose radii can cause vibration and leave unacceptably large radii in corners. When grinding our cutting tool, it may be helpful to think of its geometry not as six individual angles, but rather as three surfaces, each one constructed from two angles, called a compound angle. The side surface is a combination of the side cutting angle and the side relief angle. The end surface is a combination of the end cutting angle and the end relief angle. And the top surface is a combination of the back rake angle and the side rake angle. Both of the angles which comprise a surface must be generated simultaneously during the grinding process. That's because there are always two angles which are controlled when presenting the tool to the grinder. The first angle is adjusted by turning the tool left and right. Let's call this yaw. The second angle is adjusted by tilting the tool forward and backward. Let's call this pitch. The sequence we'll use to grind our tool is as follows. First, we'll grind the side surface with the side cutting angle ground by adjusting yaw and the side relief angle ground by adjusting pitch. Second, we'll grind the end surface with the end cutting angle ground by adjusting yaw and the end relief angle ground by adjusting pitch. 
Third, we'll grind the top surface with the back rake angle ground by adjusting yaw and the side rake angle ground by adjusting pitch. We'll use a bench stone rather than the grinder to generate the tool nose radius because it's more controllable. It's important to add a note here about grinding angles by adjusting pitch. Since we're grinding on the periphery of the wheel, the radius of the wheel leaves a curved surface on the tool. Therefore, the effective angle at the cutting edge will always be greater than the angle customarily measured across the tool. The smaller the grinding wheel, the more noticeable the effect. The 12 inch wheel on this large pedestal grinder has a negligible effect on the overall geometry. But a smaller wheel, like the 6 inch wheel on this small bench grinder, has a real impact on the effective angle at the cutting edge. Keep in mind that it may be necessary to decrease the target value for an angle by a couple of degrees to compensate for a grinding wheel with a small radius. I know you're eager to get started, but the process of grinding a cutting tool is really not quite so simple as just grabbing a piece of high speed steel and going yojimbo on the grinder. There's a lot going on at once. Sparks are flying, the tool is getting hot, and your hands are precariously positioned next to a spinning abrasive wheel. Under these conditions, it's not always easy to grind smooth, continuous surfaces with compound angles, especially if you're also trying to hit specific target values for those angles. So, the procedure we'll be demonstrating will be geared toward ensuring the success of someone grinding cutting tools for the first time. Here's a little piece of old school shop wisdom. A little bit of time spent preparing for the job will save hours on the job itself. So, we'll need some basic shop tools, we'll need to follow proper grinding technique, and we'll need to set up the grinder for the specific angles on our tool. Go ahead and gather the following items. A grinding wheel dresser of some type. A combination bench stone with a coarse grit side and a fine grit side some kind of lubricant for the stone. Of course, a piece of half-inch square M2 high-speed steel to grind, some layout die, a scriber, a six-inch rule, a protractor, a set of radius gauges, and an angle gauge, preferably digital. At the grinder, we'll follow the three Ds, dress, drift, and dunk. During the grinding process, the abrasive grinding wheel will periodically dull and begin cutting less efficiently. When this happens, we must resharpen or dress the wheel by skimming its cutting surface with a wheel dresser. The wheel will also gradually wear at the point of contact with the tool. If only a small area of the grinding wheel is used, then the profile of the wheel will wear unevenly. This will make it impossible to grind the straight edges we want on our tool. The correct profile of the wheel can be re-established by truing, a process similar to dressing which involves aggressive and selective wearing of the wheel. But it's better to keep the wheel from deforming in the first place. Therefore, we must drift from side to side with the tool, using as much of the wheel as possible. Finally, the grinding process generates quite a lot of heat. Over time, the temperature of the tool will rise and eventually become too hot to comfortably hold in your hands, and it may even begin to discolor, although a little bit of discoloration won't affect the performance of a good quality high-speed steel cutting tool. But the temperature can actually increase very quickly, especially when grinding aggressively on a dull wheel. So, we'll periodically dunk the tool in a container of cold water to cool it down. If you're worried about negative effects from this kind of thermal cycling, chill out. High-speed steel can handle it. Now we'll set up the grinder. It can be difficult to hold the tool in the correct position on the grinding wheel if it's just floating in the air without a reference. This is compounded by the need to regularly remove the tool from the wheel, to dunk the tool, to dress the wheel, to measure the angle or whatever it is, and then reposition the tool on the wheel to continue grinding. The outcome, all too often, is a multifaceted surface which is impossible to measure. To make this whole process easier, we're going to use a couple of aids, some training wheels if you will. First, for the angles adjusted by yaw, we'll scribe a line directly on the tool to follow while grinding. More on this a little later. Second, 
For the angles adjusted by pitch, we'll set up the tool rest as a reference surface so that we can lay the tool directly on top of it while grinding. Let's go ahead and set this up now. The angle which is formed in the tool is the result of a combination of three variables. The angle of the tool rest, the height or vertical position of the tool rest, and the radius of the grinding wheel. We'll only focus on one of these variables, the angle of the tool rest, because it's easy to adjust and measure. We'll leave the height of the tool rest alone and treat it as a constant. And since we're using the same grinder for all operations, the wheel radius is also a constant. Fortunately, all three of the angles adjusted by pitch, the side relief angle, the end relief angle, and the side rake angle are 10 degrees, which means we only need to set the angle of the tool rest once. We need a starting reference for adjustment, so turn on the grinder, set the tool down on the tool rest at its current angle, and push the tool straight into the wheel. Grind until you establish a continuous surface from the bottom to the top of the tool. You'll know you've ground all the way to the top because the sparks will begin bouncing off the top of the tool. Next, we'll use a protractor to measure the angle. This kind of protractor has a pivot point and measures the angle between its head and its arm. Align the arm to the bottom of the tool and pivot the head until it makes contact across the ground surface. The protractor reads 5 degrees. No good. We have to tilt the tool rest back another 5 degrees to hit our 10 degree target. Make sure the grinder is off and at a full stop before you make any adjustments to the tool rest. We'll use an angle gauge to make a precise and predictable adjustment. These inexpensive gauges are nifty shop tools with a million and one uses, including this one. Set the reading to zero so that our angle adjustments will be made from the current reference position of the tool rest, which, as we just discovered, is the position at which a 5 degree angle will be ground in the tool. Loosen the tool rest. Tilt it back until the gauge reads 5 degrees, or close to it, and then retighten the tool rest. If the gap between the tool rest and the wheel increased to more than a sixteenth of an inch while you were making the adjustment, take this opportunity to move the tool rest in closer to the wheel. Wide gaps are a serious safety hazard. Set the tool back down on the tool rest. We can already see that the adjustment made a difference. Turn the grinder on and regrind the tool at the new tool rest setting. Measure the angle with the protractor. 10 degrees. Perfect. If the tool rest on your grinder doesn't have an angle adjustment, you can still adjust the tool rest to grind the desired angle in your tool by adjusting its height. The higher the tool rest's vertical position relative to the center line of the wheel, the larger will be the angle it grinds in the tool. The downside to using this method is that there's no simple and easy way to predict which vertical position will correspond to which angle ground in the tool so you'll have to use trial and error. Again, remember to reset the gap between the tool rest and the wheel to no more than a sixteenth of an inch. In any case, now that we've set up the grinder, we can finally start grinding our cutting tool. The first surface we're going to grind, the side surface, is the most straightforward of the three surfaces on the tool. The side relief angle is 10 degrees, and will be generated by keeping the bottom of the tool directly on the tool rest. The side cutting angle is 0, and will be generated by keeping the left side of the tool parallel to the grinding wheel. We only need to grind back about a half an inch from the end of the tool, so mark a visual reference on the top of the tool using a 6 inch rule. Align the tool on the grinder. Proceed to grind the side surface, making sure to dress when necessary, drift from side to side, and dunk frequently. You can see the newly ground surface progressing up the left side of the tool from bottom to top. The top of the ground surface should be straight and parallel to the top of the tool. If it isn't, adjust the yaw to correct the angle. Keep going until the surface reaches the top of the tool. And be patient. It can take a while to grind away all that material, and you may have to dunk the tool quite a few times. This surface is getting close, but it's not quite there. 
Stopping at this point would be a mistake, because the top of the tool at the cutting edge is where the angles really matter. There we go. Let's inspect the angles. The side relief angle is 9.5 degrees. Close enough. And using a 6 inch rule as a straight edge, the side cutting angle appears to be parallel with the side of the tool. Good. The second surface we're going to grind, the end surface, is a little more complicated. The end relief angle is 10 degrees and will be generated by keeping the bottom of the tool directly on the tool rest. The end cutting angle is 15 degrees and will be generated by turning the tool 15 degrees to the left. To make it easier to guide the tool at the correct angle, we'll scribe a reference line directly on the tool. We'll use some layout die for contrast to increase the visibility of the line. Shake up the bottle before you open it and then paint a light, even coat on the top of the tool. Allow the layout die to dry completely. Set the protractor to 15 degrees and align the protractor arm on the right side of the tool. Use a sharp scriber to mark a line in the die, following the edge of the protractor head. We'll keep this line parallel to the wheel while grinding. Align the tool on the grinder. Proceed to grind the end surface. The newly ground surface will progress from the bottom right corner up to the top left corner of the tool. Keep going until the surface reaches the very tip of the tool. This surface is not quite finished. You can see a little bit of stock surface right at the tip, so again, stopping at this point would be a big mistake. That's more like it. Let's inspect the angles. Verify the end relief angle. 10 degrees. Great. And the end cutting angle measures 15 degrees. Right on the money. The third surface we're going to grind, the top surface, is usually the most challenging for tool grinding neophytes to conceptualize. The side rake angle is 10 degrees and will be generated by keeping the right side of the tool directly on the tool rest. The back rake angle is also 10 degrees and will be generated by turning the tool 10 degrees and hooking the far end of the tool around the side of the wheel. We'll scribe another reference line directly on the tool for this angle, but first let's remove the layout die from the previous operation. Acetone works well as a solvent for this task. Just spray it on and the layout die and marker come right off. Now, paint a light, even coat of dye on the previously ground side surface of the tool. Set the protractor to 10 degrees and align the protractor head on the bottom of the tool. Scribe a line in the die, following the edge of the protractor arm. We'll keep this line parallel to the wheel while grinding. Align the tool on the grinder. Proceed to grind the top surface. Notice how the far end of the tool is hooked around the side of the wheel. The newly ground surface will dig into the tool and progress from about a half inch back on the right side of the tool up to the left top corner. Keep grinding all the way to the very tip of the tool. This surface still has a little way to go, so don't stop yet. That looks much better. Let's inspect the angles. Verify the side rake angle. 10 degrees, just what we'd expect. We'll measure the back rake angle in front of a bright background like a piece of white paper to improve contrast. The angle is measured in the same way the reference line is scribed. Set the protractor to 10 degrees. Place the protractor head on the bottom of the tool. Line up the protractor arm with the back rake angle and compare the two edges. This looks pretty close. Use the acetone again to remove the layout die. We still need to generate the 1 32nd of an inch radius on the tool nose. We'll use an abrasive bench stone for this operation because it's much more controllable and forgiving than the grinder. This type of stone has a fine grit on one side for polishing and a coarse grit on the other side for roughing a geometry. We'll start with the coarse grit side. Apply some lubricant to keep the material from loading up the stone. The radius will extend from the tool nose all the way to the bottom of the tool, following the edge at the intersection of the side surface and the end surface. Set this edge down parallel to the top of the stone. Do not point the tool nose down or you will dull the cutting edge. 
Starting from the far end of the stone with the side of the tool nearly parallel to the top of the stone, drag the tool toward you while simultaneously rotating it. At the end of the stroke, the side of the tool should be about perpendicular to the top of the stone. Repeat this process as many times as necessary until a radius of the correct size has been generated. This appears to be an appropriate size, but the best way to know for sure is to check the radius with a set of radius gauges. Each one of these gauges has various permutations of the same size radius stamped into it. A common set contains gauges ranging from 1 64th of an inch radius to half of an inch radius in increments of 1 64th of an inch. Remove the 1 32nd gauge, as well as the 3 64th gauge and the 1 64th gauge, which we'll use to inspect the upper and lower limits of the tool nose radius. Hold the tool in front of a bright background like a light fixture to improve contrast. Start with the 1 32nd gauge. Place one of the radii on the gauge over the tool nose and compare the two radii. If you don't see any gaps between the gauge and the tool, then the tool nose radius is close to a 32nd of an inch. This looks like a pretty good match. Let's see how the 3 64th gauge compares. The tool nose touches in the center of the gauge radius, but there are noticeable gaps on either side. Therefore, the tool nose radius is smaller than 3 64th of an inch. Let's see how the 1 64th gauge compares. The tool nose touches on the sides of the gauge radius, but there is a noticeable gap in the center. Therefore, the tool nose radius is larger than 1 64th of an inch. Looks like the 1 32nd radius gauge was the best fit after all. Excellent! Make sure to put the radius gauges back in the pouch and fold everything up. It's very, very easy to lose these little gauges. We're almost done! Switch over to the fine grit side of the bench stone and lube it up. We're going to polish all of the critical surfaces on the tool to produce a keen cutting edge. Start with the tool nose radius, then the side surface, next the end surface, and finally the top surface. That's it, we're done! But how do we know the tool will perform to expectations? I often do a quick test for sharpness by checking how easily the tool shaves my fingernail, although I have to say some people find this to be a disgusting habit. The best way to test a cutting tool is to take a cut with it. Nice chips, a smooth finish, this tool has been approved. Well, there's your procedure for grinding a general purpose right hand cutting tool. And that's it for part two of our five part series on tool grinding. Stay tuned for part three in which I grind this left hand cutting tool or facing tool on the same grinder. And as always, I hope you learned something.